focus on hearing Dot's story. But as many of you know, um, you know, she, her journey probably started a lot earlier, but at age 15, she was one of four African-American students uh, going into Harding High School to integrate. And she experienced, as uh, she will tell us, a lot of racial opposition, harassment, abuse, um, you know, unspeakable uh, things that she had to face. But really, she started on a journey. And um, as I have learned about her and listened to her and read about her, her whole life has been committed to um, providing all children an equal education, um, to being an educator, award-winning educator, a spokesperson for um, children, education, and communities. So with that, I'm going to ask Malcolm to just set the stage and take us back to a little bit about DOT, and then we will turn it over to our honored guest tonight. We had a, just to bring everybody on the call up to speed, we had a I taught a course of the past month, uh, four sessions called Race and Us, How We Got Here, Where We Might Go. And uh, it was kind of a multimedia. We did a number of things. But on the second session, we talked about um, everything from literacy tests to, to um, uh, Jim Crow laws and how people responded to those. And at one point, I'll share the screen for this. Um, um, we, we talked about just to bring, cause just to remind the students, um, we talked about the story of Ruby Bridges and, uh, the Norman, the famous Norman Rockwell painting that came from that story and the time and the story of Ruby Bridges going to the white house, talking to Obama, who, Barack Obama, who had put the painting in the White House. And you remember that we talked about that. And, and uh, as he famously said, if you hadn't been in that picture, we probably wouldn't be standing here talking. Um, and this painting as well, another Rockwell painting. And we talked about Bull Connor, who was a police commissioner in Birmingham, Alabama. And, and, we, and we talked about the fire hoses and the dogs and kind of what, what happened. And, and you know, I was at the time, I was a kid in New Hampshire. I was, you know, seven, eight, nine years old. I didn't, uh, in, in a very, uh, in a non-diverse state, uh, if you will. And I didn't, I was, so everything I knew about this was what I saw on television or I saw in the newspapers and I saw in magazines. And some of these photos were just, were just, if you grew up in the 60s, you know, before the internet and all that stuff, these photos were just sort of like seared into you, and you saw them a lot. And uh, one of and one of the ones is this one that we talked about. And uh, although I was only three years old when this was taken, it was one of those photos that I knew as a kid, and I can remember wondering, you know, what would I do? You know, what would I do if I were this fifteen-year-old girl in that situation? And I used to wonder about that. And so we talk about it in the class. And as I said to uh, Dot, just before we all got together, it's just in my wildest imaginations, I didn't think that when I was showing this slide a month ago, that we would have her on this uh, screen and she would be talking to us. But what a special moment uh, to have you with us. And a real honor and, and thanks for joining us. And I give, without further ado, Dot Count Scoggins. Well, thank you so very much for uh, inviting me to be a part of this this evening. Um, it was ironic because a message was sent to me by Laura. A lot of times what happens to me is at my age, I don't always check my messages. And I saw this message from her uh, explaining to me what she wanted to do. And I just said, this is my telephone number. Call me. I mean, I, I use technology, but I am not like young people today. I, and I told her, I said, I do text, but at the same time, I like to talk to people on the phone now since I cannot do it face to face. So um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna start out uh, talking to you about 
um, that day, and a little bit before that day, but this was for me, a, um, my going to Harding was an attempt to change the education system in this country. Of course, 1957, we lived in a segregated world. And uh, I am, I have three other siblings. My father was a college professor and we lived uh, on the campus at Johnson C. Smith University. And uh, it was Harding High School was two blocks from where I lived. But of course, I had been attending predominantly black schools on what we call the card here. And of course, during that particular time, there were busing, there was busing, but the busing was for white students. So we had to walk to school or be taken to school by our parents or catch a city bus because the high school I had been assigned to was a little over a mile from where I lived. My father being a minister, but also a very much involved in the community. Uh, <clears throat> and we lived in a neighborhood of people that were uh, ministers, lawyers, uh, professors, uh, as well as people who did domestic work too. But one of the things they used to have these conversations about making changes within our community but they had to do it in their own homes. They had to do, make sure that when they did them, they did them in the evening. And I always say they had these serious conversations across the dinner table. Well, 1957 was three years after Brown and nothing had been done in Charlotte or even in the surrounding communities around in North Carolina. And so they had this conversation and said, let's see if we can test the system in Charlotte. And at that time, the late Kelly Alexander, who was head of the NAACP, got all of the, uh, all these uh, people together in the community. And he said, let's test the system and see what happens. So they approached 20, they selected 20 families in Charlotte in different communities and said, would you be willing to apply for your child or children to go to predominantly white schools in your community? And of course, my father was a part of that group and there were three of us that were still in, in, in school. And my, bro my older brother was a senior in high school. I have a younger brother who was in the tent, it was in elementary school and I was going into high school as a sophomore in the 10th grade. So when dad came home and he talked to all of us about it and he said, what do you think? Well, I grew up in a family that I was taught, I think because my father was a minister, but also my father was the kind of person who believed that you know, as an American citizen, we had rights. And a lot of he used to always say, some things are just morally right. And so he, uh, as we talked more about it, I said to him, you know, um, am I going to be the only one? And of course, he said, well, I made application for your brother as well. So I, you know, I thought about it and I said, well, I have been with my friends from first grade because then, you know, everybody in the community went to the same school. And I said, now I'm going to a new school. And I don't know anyone there, but then I thought about it. I said, well, I was, I was also going to a new high school, even though some of my friends were going to be there, but maybe this would be a new challenge for me. And I tell people all my life, you know, I have a, my dad always said, you know, I, I was the right child to be chosen because I like challenges. Well, I went away in uh, the first part of August, uh, the Presbyterian Church has what they call a biennium. And they have uh, young people from the Presbyterian Church, youth, come to a, uh, together for a week. And it was at Grinnell College in Iowa. So we traveled from Charlotte to Grinnell. Of course, you know, this is still segregation time by bus 
And um, and for that week we were there. One of the ex when I got there, I found out that uh, I had my roommate was not going to be someone that was on the trip with me. My roommate was a white young. Uh, she was 15 year old girl from a, a small town in Illinois it's called Robinson, Illinois. Well, that was my first experience of being in, uh, sleeping in the room or even being in the presence uh, that close to someone that did not look like me. And of course, you know, I greeted her. She didn't, she wouldn't say anything. I noticed she watched me. And finally I said, after the first night, I said, we are gonna be living together for the rest of the week. So at least we need to be able to talk to each other. And then she proceeded to share with me a lot of myths that she had been taught. She wanted to know where was my tail? Uh, if I rub up against you, will, will, your, uh, will the color come off? Uh, she wanted to feel my hair, those kinds of things. And, and, and I said to her, I said, these are myths that you have heard or taught. But I am like you in so many ways. The only difference is, is your skin is different. Your, the color of your skin is different from mine. So just imagine us living together for a week. But by, I can say by the end of that week that at least we were talking to each other. We exchanged addresses. She shared with me that she lived on a farm and she didn't uh, go into town. She didn't. That I was the first black person she had ever seen. And so uh, I told her, I said, well, when I left, when we left, I said, we need to keep in touch, but I've had a learning lesson and so have you. I've learned more about your culture and more about you. And I have tried to share with you about my culture and more about me. So when I came back to Charlotte, that's when I was told that I had been accepted to Harding High School. Um, and I was the only one, my brothers uh, were, were denied, their applications were denied. But I felt that after I had had that experience at, uh, at Grinnell, that things would be okay. That was a, a first experience for me. My going to Harding was gonna be a new experience. But deep down inside, I felt, well, at least I've had that experience. When I got up that morning on September the 4th, 1957, we sat at the dinner table I, and because that was a ritual in our family. My mother did not work, but she made sure she had breakfast on the table. We ate breakfast before we left home every day. And we did it as a family, all of us. And um, so my father said to me, uh, about any thoughts that I might have in terms of the day of them. And I said, I really hadn't thought much about it, but I, I, I feel that I'm gonna be okay. And he did, he encouraged me. And he said, I know you'll be fine. You will, mem you will remember all the things that you have been taught and I'm sure you're gonna be fine. In the picture that you showed, the person who's walking behind me is Dr. Tompkins. And Dr. Tompkins was Dean of the Theology at Johnson C. Smith, lived in the community. I was also one of my father's very, very close friends. And he came by that morning and he just said, I just thought I'd stop by to see if there's anything I could do. My dad said, I'm not sure what uh, to expect when we get there. Maybe you should just go with me. So when he drove, so they, the, the two of them they drove me to, to the school, and when I got there, the entrance uh, was blocked. It was barricaded. Police were there. And when I looked out the window, I saw all of these people. I'd say anyway, two or three hundred. It was students as well as adults. The, what I remember as I got out of the car, my dad said to me, I want you to remember, you are inferior to no one. You can do anything that you want to do. Hold your head up high and be proud. So that's 
what resonated with me when I got out of the car. And of course, he told Dr. Tompkins, he said, I want you to walk with her He's, because I need to find some place to park. So we began that two block walk to the auditorium. I kept remember what my dad said, hold your head up high. I kept my eyes on the entrance of the front door because I felt once I got inside, things would be a lot better. Yes, there was pushing, there was shoving, they had made signs, they used the N-word, go back to Africa, we don't want you here. Uh, they were throwing rocks and ice and those kinds of things. But there was a woman in the crowd who, when she found out that the four students had been assigned to predominantly white schools, she formed a white citizens council. And she, she was going to each one of the communities where the kids were uh, from the neighborhoods where the kids were going to be and talking to the white residents and saying to them, we cannot let them get through that door. She chose to come to Hardy that morning. And she was the one who was uh, edging the kids on, telling them what to do. But she's the one who said to the, to the kids, spit on her. Don't let her get through that door. So you can imagine someone spitting on you. And I tell people that dress I wore, my grandmother was a seamstress. And she made me a new dress to wear to school every single year. And that was my new dress to wear on September the 4th to school. So by the time I got to the, to the door in the auditorium, spit was dripping from the bottom of my dress. No one greeted me. I walked in the auditorium and there were students, some students there. Of course, a lot of the students were outside. So I looked to where I could find a seat to sit down. And uh, I walked about midway and I sat uh, on, on the end, at the end seat and I sat down. Of course, by this time, students were coming in from outside. The principal was on the stage, uh, I guess, waiting for everyone to, to come in. And no one adult ever came up to me during that time. The procedure was, at that particular time, you went to school the first day, you only stayed half a day, and you received your books, and you also received your schedule uh, for, the, for, the, uh, for that semester. So as they, they called uh, us by name and asked us to come up and sit with our class, well, that's the class that, you, that was your homeroom class. And I, uh, I moved up closer to the stage and um, I sat between two young girls and one did strike up a conversation with me and she said she was also new. They had recently moved to Charlotte. Uh, she said, are you afraid? Uh, I am. This is my first time at this school. I don't know anybody. And so I said, well, this is my first time in this school. I don't know anybody either. So hopefully you and I can, we have the same situation and hopefully you and I will be able to, you know, uh, be friends. And then of course, uh, they excused us to our homeroom class. And when I walked in that homeroom, the teacher never spoke to me. She ignored me as if I was not in the class. When I got ready to leave uh, that uh, at around noontime, uh, my father came back to pick me up and he brought with him one of the, uh, uh, Reginald Hawkins, who was a big advocate. He was a part of that group to test the system. He was also a local dentist and minister in Charlotte. And um, he came and he walked with me because the crowds, when I left, they congregated all outside for my leaving. So when I got in the car and got home and my dad said, how did it go? And I shared with him what had happened. And he said, well, how do you feel? Do you want to go back tomorrow? And I said, absolutely. You know, I said, you know, I think uh, as time goes that they will get used to me and, I will, and things will get a lot better. 
And of course, the next morning, that was on a Thursday. The next morning when I woke up, I had a very high fever. I ended up with a sore throat. My parents called the doctor. Back then, the doctor would come to the house. And he came and he suggested that I needed to stay in for the weekend and I should be okay by Monday. So my father called the school and told uh, the principal that I would be returning on Monday. So when he took me to school on Monday, guess what? There were no crowds outside. And I'm sure the reason for that was because of the fact that they thought, okay, we got rid of her. She didn't come to school on Friday. She's not coming back. And when I walked into the school and the students saw me, that's when it started all over again. Uh, pushing and shoving and um, when I was then, you know, walking up, if I had a class on the third floor, and you, you know, you're going up stairwells and kids were, you know, pushing and shoving and of course making all kinds of racial slurs. And what they had done is they had put my locker uh, on the same hallway where the principal's office was. And of course, all of y'all know, and I'm sure you do the same things, when kids are changing classes, all the teachers are standing out in the hall. So of course, teachers were there as well as the principal. And several times, you know, I looked at him and he just turned around and walked back into his office. And, I, and of course, I proceeded to follow my schedule as I was assigned, went into class, they had assigned me to sit in the back of the class. I raised my hand to answer a question. It looked like I was, I was invisible. I was not there. And so that was on Monday. The same thing happened when my dad picked me up and I shared with him. And of course, the question was asked again. And I said, yes, I am determined. I am going to do this. I know I can do this and things are going to be better. So then on, when, on Tuesday, I was sitting in the cafeteria by myself. And uh, all of a sudden, a group of boys circled my table. And one of them uh, reached over and spat in my food. I picked up my tray, put it on the conveyor belt, and I walked outside. And that's when I ran into the young lady that I had met the first day. She was outside. So she and I sat outside on the lawn and I explained to her what happened. She, of course, she wanted to know how I felt. And she, she talked about the kinds of things because she had witnessed some of the things that were going on in the school to me as well. And I, and I said to her, you know, it's going to be okay. Uh, and, you know, thank, eventually they will see that in a lot of ways, I am a lot like them. My skin might be different, but I'm a teenager. I have some of the same wants and desires that they have, but things will get better. I am sure they will get better. Um, so when I went home that day, I said to my parents, I said, you know, a lot of the things that are going on in school, that I can take those things, but I can't stay in school all day and not eat. And they had a policy that you could leave the campus at lunchtime as long as you were back for your classes after lunch. So I said, can you come pick me up tomorrow at lunchtime? At least I can come home for lunch. And uh, so that was the plan. And um, at lunch, when it was time for me to leave for lunch, I walked to my locker. I was standing there to get my sweater out of the locker. And all of a sudden, a sharp object hit me in the back of my head and a blackboard eraser hit me in my back. And I turned around and there were a group of students that were standing there. So I, I walked to the door to walk outside and I saw my parents' car. And it was, sh the back window was shattered in a million pieces. You know, you hit glass and it just shatters. And that was the first time that I was afraid because I said to myself, now it's not only me, but now they're targeting my family. But I didn't realize that the person in the car was my older brother. And he had been in Connecticut for the summer working and he stopped in New York to visit family. And when he picked up the New York Times 
and my picture was on the front page. He said, oh my, that's my sister. So then of course he came home. So my father had sent him uh, to pick me up. So when I got home, he said to my parents, he said, God has something to share with you. And I told him about the incident of the back of my head and the black boy racer and you know the fear because after I saw the car, so my father immediately got on the phone. He called the superintendent of schools and he shared with him what had happened. And he said to my dad, he said, I call every day, I called every day. And no one has said anything like that has gone on. He said, Well, my this is my daughter. She has no reason to lie. And he said, All I need to know is can can you guarantee my daughter's safety in the school? I have sent her there for an education. And I expect that this is, this is what needs to happen. Can you guarantee that? And he said, well, I, I, I just don't know. So then he got off the phone. He called the police department, the police chief. He said to him the same thing. And of course, he said, we cannot guarantee her safety. So then that's when we all sat down and we talked about it. And my dad said to me, you know, I sent you to school to get an education. I did not send you to school to be harassed. I knew there were probably going to be some things that would happen, but you know, it's a, your education is important. And he said, as an American citizen, as a person who pays taxes, he said that you deserve to have the same as everybody else does. So he said, I am not, you're not going back. And I said, today? And he said, no. Uh, if they can't guarantee your safety, I cannot leave you in that school. So then he called a press conference and of course he announced that I would not be returning to Hardy. So of course the next step was, where am I gonna go? Uh, and I could have gone back to the high school, to the black high school that I was assigned to, but they said that they wanted me to go where I could see in a diverse population of students on community where I could see what happened to me at Harding. Everybody did not think that way. I had aunt and, aunt and uncle who lived in a, uh, Pennsylvania, Yaden, Pennsylvania, which is a suburb of Philadelphia, very small community. And they contacted them and said, you know, we'd like to send Dot up and she could stay with you for the rest of the year and go to school. It was a public school. Um, and, um, so they, of course, they said yes. And I had aunt, uh, aunt and uncle that also lived in Philadelphia too as well. So I'd be with family and that's where I went. Uh, I finished out that year. It was a wonderful year. The kids were great, teachers were great. And I found out at the end of the year that the principal had had a meeting with all the students and the faculty. And he had said to them, he explained to them who I was, what had happened, of why I was coming to Dayton High School. And they, he said, but I need you to treat her just like anybody else. She's not any different than anybody else here in this school. Treat her the same. And that's the way I was treated. But you have to remember, I'm in Pennsylvania. I live in North Carolina. And I said to my parents, when I came home for Christmas, that was the only time during that year that I could come home. And I said to them, is there any way possible that I can be closer to home? Because I miss my family. And so my parents looked into it when I came, they picked me up at the end of the school year and they told me that they had made arrangements for me to go to a private boarding school in Asheville, North Carolina. It was an all girls school. It was a school that was started by the Methodist church in Western North Carolina because a lot of the schools for black children in Western, uh, Western North Carolina were not accredited. And so this school was started in the late 1800s, with Allen High School for Girls. And so that's where I went. And that's where, um, of course, it was not an integrated school naturally in, in the late 50s, but the faculty was, and most, most of the people that were there uh, were part of the Methodist Church and, um, but I, that's where I graduated from. And then I decided after graduation that um, 
I, or in terms of going to college, I applied to several schools, but then I did, my, my father asked me, he said, you have not made a decision about where you're going to college. And I said, yes, I have. And he said, where are you going to go? You haven't told us. And I said, I'm going to Johnson C. Smith. And the reason for that is because my father went to Johnson C. Smith for his undergrad. My father went to the seminary at Johnson C. Smith. I have aunts, uncles. I have three brothers. So there's a, all of them. And he said, well, I'm surprised. And I said, why? He said, I thought you would want to go away. And I said, if it's good enough for you, it's good enough for me. So not only that, I could be home with my family. So uh, Johnson C. Smith, I uh, attended Johnson C. Smith here in Charlotte, graduated from Smith with a degree in psychology and sociology and a minor in counseling. And after graduation, I left Charlotte. I moved to, uh, moved to uh, New York. I accepted a job uh, working in a center for abused and neglected children. It was a part of the social service system. And I did that. And they went on strike. My dad called me. He said, you don't cross picket lines. You don't know nothing about that. And I said, well, dad, I've got to work. He said, well, you, you know, you don't cross a picket line. I had an aunt who worked in a preschool program uh, in the Bronx and uh, on Gun Hill Road with the housing development there. And she said, Doc, we're looking for teachers. We need someone for five-year-olds. And of course, I, I had always said I'd never be a teacher. And the reason for that was because my, my goal was to be a, so, a social worker. But uh, because my father was a teacher, my aunts, uncles, everybody in my family were teachers. And I said, that's one profession I will not choose. And I ended up doing exactly what I said that I would not do. Uh, so I worked there for three years. Um, and that was when I realized how important it was that at children at uh, that age need to learn acceptance and learn at, at an early age, hopefully by the time they are 15, they will not have to go through what I went through at 15. So, because I said at 15, whatever I did in life, I was gonna make sure it didn't happen to another child. So that start, that was how my career path started. Um, after being in New York for three years, I moved back to North Carolina. Uh, I was married by then and moved back to North Carolina. And I, uh, at first I didn't do, I didn't work, uh, but then I finally got a job working in a preschool a program. And then I became an administrator. So that's how I got started in early childhood education. I was in that field for 40 years. I taught at the community college level uh, for people that are in early childhood education. I directed child care centers. I worked for a resource and referral agency, um, and I retired in 2012. But during that whole time, everything that I did, that's when my advocacy started. For children, the younger they are, is when we need to get to them. We can't wait until they get to high school to try to teach them the lessons that you're trying to teach them. We need to start at a very young age. So my concentration has always been um, uh, children birth to five. And uh, when I retired in 2012, I said, okay, um, I have to work in 40 years. It's time for me now to figure out what I'm going to do. I'm not going to go home, put a blanket over my knees, sit in a rocking chair. I said, uh, then I looked at what was going on in the school system here in Charlotte. It had made a big turn. It was almost the way it was when I went to school in 1957. And a lot of that came as a result of redistricting. A lot of that came as a result of having different superintendents. A lot of that uh, came as a result of Charlotte's cha changes in Charlotte. Families were moving into Charlotte from the north. 
They were used to going to schools that were predominant where they had very few black children. They wanted to have more, uh, they wanted um, what we call neighborhood schools. And so one, there was one parent and then we had a, a magnet, magnet programs in Charlotte at the time. Yes, we had busing. Charlotte was declared uh, a city world-class for education because of integration. And that came about in the early 70s. Um, and they didn't like what was going on. So what they did is they sued the school system to stop busing. And they wanted neighborhood schools. So that's when it started. And now it's, uh, we yes, kids are bused to school. But at the same time, when they, re, when they did the redistricting of schools, they tend to put all the children in, from the same socioeconomic uh, communities together. And a lot of our schools are predominantly black and brown children. So that's when my advocacy started, more so. And that is what can we, these children deserve the same quality education that the kids that live across town deserve. So that's where, uh, that's what I've been doing for the last eight years. Uh, I have a birthday next month and I'm not getting any younger, but what I tell people is that as long as I can get out and fight for our children, and I, when I say our children, it doesn't make, it's not all black and brown children. I, I, I'm an advocate for those children who don't have a voice or their parents don't have a voice, or don't understand they need to have a voice to speak up for their children. So I am that person who does that. Uh, I happen that I moved back in the community where I grew up in as a child. It had changed a lot. I saw uh, the schools were uh, under-resourced. They were primarily black and brown children. Uh, so my fight was to make sure that those children in those schools on what I call the corridor will have the same resources as the others. So that's basically my life, what I'm doing, why I have done it <laughs> and why I continue to do it. And as long as I can, I will continue to fight for all children, not just a group of children, but all children. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dot. Um, I'm going to ask if, uh, as we're getting people to either write a question for you or if they want to say something to you, I just, if you could just take a very couple of minutes and just share what you shared about that gentleman that came to you. Uh, I believe his name was Woody. And then while exactly. Dot is saying that, if you have a question or if you want to say something to Dot, just put your name uh, to me, message me, please. Go ahead, Dot. Okay. Um, 50 years after my, uh, my, uh, at Harding, after my being at Harding, I received an email from the Charlotte Observer, which is our local newspaper. And they said that, um, they had someone who had sent an email and wanted to get in touch with me. But what happened was there was a big 50 year celebration here in Charlotte of that event. Um, and so I, they said, we cannot give him your information, but if you'd like, we will send you the email. And uh, so I got this email from this young man. His name was Woody Cooper. And he, he, he shared with me that he was at Harding that day and that he is also one of the ones in that picture. He was sitting in his Sunday school class and his Sunday school teacher also was a student at Harding and, and he, they, were, they were talking about forgiveness. And he asked them, he said, is there anyone in the class today, if they had the opportunity to forgive someone, who would that be and why? And Woody said, Dorothy counts. And he went on to tell the story that he was at Harding the day that I attempted to integrate that school, he was in the crowd of boys that were outside. Uh, but he said, and, and I didn't do anything is what he said. I was following my peers. Uh, 
but I wish that I had done something that day to help her. And I am asking for her forgiveness. It's asking for your forgiveness. Well, I read it several times. That was the first correspondence that I had received from anyone from that day. Now, this is 50 years later. I slept on it. I got up the next morning and I, re I replied back to Woody. And I said to you, I forgave you 50 years ago. That was an error in our lives where you were taught one thing and I was taught another. You were taught hatred. I was taught forgiveness. So I forgave you. But now what we can do is two people together that we can go out and make sure that what happened at Harding and what happened to me does not happen to your, your grandchildren, my grandchildren, and other children. So he responded, and I gave him my contact information, and he called me. And we talked on the phone, and then what he did, he and I did, we traveled together as a duo to several schools, talking to students about what happened that day, but also the importance of education, number one, but also forgiveness. And um, we did a piece on the local uh, TV, the same thing. So this was over a period of years. Uh, we we uh, met in the park. We had lunch with his family and my family, my children, his children. And he said to me, Doc, he said, you know, I'd like for us to go out to dinner. And I said, that's fine. He said, where do you want to go? I said, I want to go someplace that you could go in 1957 that I could not go. And he mentioned a, a restaurant that's not very far from where I live now. And I, and I said, yes, you're right. You, he said, that's where we used to hang out when we were teenagers. I said, yes, you could go inside but I had to go around to the back to the window if I wanted to pick up my food. And so that's where we went with his wife and it, our relationship just developed over a period of, of time. And uh, in Charlotte, there's something called a forgiving bench. It's, at the, it's called Freedom Park, one of the largest parks in the downtown area. And there's a forgiving bench and we asked to dedicate that bench. At that time, he had, he, he had been diagnosed with cancer. He wasn't able to come, but his family came with me and it was dedicated, the two of us were dedicating that bench in Freedom Park, the Forgiving Bench. Shortly after that, his wife called me and she said, Don, I just need you to know that, that Woody is now in hospice. And I, I told her, I said, well, can I come and visit him? And so we, uh, I said, I will come after work. And I did. And I went to the hospital center where he was. I walked in the room, of course, his family was there. And the nurse said to me, he can hear you, but he probably will not respond to you. So Judy said, sit down next to the bed. And I sat next to the bed and I talked to him. I talked about the things that he and I had talked about, you know, in the past, the things we had done. We talked about gave him an update on my family, my kids, my grandchildren. And so I was there for about two hours. And I got ready to leave. I grabbed his hand and I, and I squeezed his hand. And I felt a slight squeeze to my hand, which means he, he had to have heard what I said as the nurse had said. I reached over, kissed him on the forehead, and hugged Judy and the kids, and I left. And the next morning, I got a call from Judy, and she said to me, she said, Dot, he was waiting on you. He died two hours after you left. So um, for me, I have, I say that that's, that's a situation that happened in my life. And things happened for a reason. And how, it, it came full circle. Yes, he was a part of that group. Maybe he should have, maybe should not have been there, but for whatever reason, he was there. But he reached out, and as a part of him reaching out, 
that it ended up that we became very good friends. And I, I hope that, that the things that we did together with the kids in the schools and other places that we spoke together, that we get, we, this was a message to people to let them know that you can forgive someone for things that happen. And I say that to young people all the time. When they say to me, I don't see how you could do that. I cannot let anyone do that to me. And I always say to them, but just remember, if I do the same thing to, did the same thing to them that they did to me, that I am no better than they are. And I am better than that because I know that I'm better than that. So you are better than that. So that's my forgiveness story. <laughs> Thank you, John. Thank you so much. So I have a couple. Um, uh, Murphy Duffy is has a question, and then one of our students, Colin, would like to make a comment to you. Go ahead, Miss Duffy. Hi. Thank you so much for speaking tonight. Um, I just have a quick question. So when you were discussing um, when you were first going to high school, you had so much courage to keep going back and keep going back and wanting to go back every day. Where did you find that courage to just keep persevering and moving forward? Well, I have, I have, I have to say to you, a lot of that came from my parents as well as from my grandparents. I was fortunate in that um, my grandparents uh, were not educated the way my parents were. But at the same time, I spent summers with them. But I always say the wisdom, the things that they taught me were more so, it was better than them going into a classroom every day. So I learned a lot from my grandparents. This is my father's parents. And also from my, from my parents. And it started when I was a young child. Um, and I think a lot of it had, had to do with the encouragement that I got from both of my parents growing up um, and sharing things with, with us as, as kids. Um, and I think it was in the other part of it, remember I said, when I got out of the car, the words that my father said to me, those were the things that I could be anything that I wanted to be, that I was inferior to no one and to hold my head up high and be proud. So that's what I carried with me. So that's helped me to be able to get through what I got through. Thank you. Go ahead, Colin. Yeah, well, you know, it, it's crazy. Um, when I, I'm, I just graduated from high school, I'm a post-grad here. And when I was a sophomore, there is no way I could have ever done what you could have done. You know, just being like, you, you knew what was going to happen, yet you showed up anyways. And I just could not think of that. You know, like, I think that is just incredibly courageous and uh, just like mad props to you. Um, and then my question is, you know, I... I like to think that we have made a lot of progress, but you know, this last year we had a lot of protests and all of that kind of stuff. And I'm just wondering with all your years of activism and what advice do you have for us to, that all of us can, we, we can do to help make, you know, racism in America better. One of the things that I guess I'm excited about is the fact that, you know, this is a, a new generation, and you were part of that new generation. And um, young people today don't think the way young people did 10, 15, 20 years ago. And um, you have stood up for a lot of things. Uh, and I think you have voiced what your concerns are in many ways. Uh, and I think if, and I, what I say is it's going gonna, it's gonna to be after the pandemic, whenever it ends, it's going to be the new normal. You're going to be a part of the new normal. Uh, there are things that you see that have happened over the last couple, I say last three or four years, and that you want to see change happen, not only for you, but for even for people like myself. <laughs> so just continue to advocate, fight, speak up, and don't be afraid to speak up 
And even at my age, I tell people now, you know, I'm not afraid to speak up. You know, I'm not a part of that millennium group, but I am a, I'm a person, you gotta hear my voice. People always say, well, if you don't hear her voice, you know what she's thinking because all you have to do is look at her and you can tell that she disagrees with what you're saying. So I'm saying that to you and you're, and, um, you're, and you're uh, you know, the young people that you are uh, growing up with and people that are participating with you and wanting to see change. Because I guess when I think of it at 15, I probably was a part of thinking that way in terms of seeing things change for us. And that's why I always say, you know, I was a part of changing the, the education system in this country. So now there are things that you want, things that you want to see differently. So you be a part of making sure that those changes happen. Thank you, Dot. Now, another question came in, Dot, um, that on the day when your father made the decision um, to not to send you to Harding anymore, how did you feel? Was did you have any mixed feelings about not returning to Harding? Well, I felt as if I had failed, um, first of all, uh, and I understood, you know, because my father and mother both explained to me, uh, you know, why they had made the decision because they felt that my safety. And I also found out that my uh, after that, my parents had also been threatened, uh, which I was not aware of, and. And my father said he didn't tell me those things because he did not want me to walk into a sea of fear that day, my first day of Hardy. Um, so, uh, but I understood, you know, after we had conversation. But deep down inside, you know, I kept saying to me, uh, to myself, that uh, I wish that I could have stayed because I really felt that had I stayed longer, then maybe they would have gotten to know who I was. Now, the other three students stayed for the remaining year. Gus did graduate from high school, but he went to a different type of high school than I went to. And his sister was in middle school, and then, of course, Dolores is in another middle school. So they stayed through the year. They had some things happen to them, but nothing like what happened to me. Uh, they got more support from the administration that I got. Um, and the little things that happened with them were just small small things, but not the uh, abuse and um, those kinds of things with them. But they, they made a choice not to go back after them, after the first year. So then that's why we went several years before actually started all of this. Right. All right, we just have time for a couple more and then we're gonna wrap up. Malcolm? Got on mute. <laughs> well, I have one question. Being the history, uh, I, as I told the students, you know, I, I majored in history and, and kind of minored in African American history and, and, and just was always fascinated by the subject. And did you have heroes of your own? Uh, um, <laughs> at that, that, that you looked up to, that, that inspired you? I'd just be curious. Well, it, it's ironic you ask me that because um, I, I'm asked that question all the time. And usually what I say, people don't want to hear. But when people <laughs> ask me that, I say the person that was my mentor, the person that was a hero to me was my dad. Yep. And they said, oh, oh, no, I don't mean family. I said, my dad. And, and, and I believe, I've always said, that God put my father on this earth to serve. And that's what I saw him do. Not only as a, uh, a minister, but also as a professor in the university, you know, working with students, working with the community. And I saw what he did. And that made me say, that's the person I admire the most out of everybody else, because that's the person that I want to be. And that's what I have tried to do the same thing. So I feel that, that that's why I was put here on this earth to serve. And that's exactly what I have tried to do. So that's not 
people ask me, oh, well, there any live people here? I said, there are a lot of people that I admire, you know, but I pattern my life after my dad. Well, that's, that's, thank you. That's awesome. Joe, I think we'll have uh, our founder who founded the school on the idea that every individual has unique potential that defines a destiny. So we'll let Joey, uh, do you, would you like to say something to Dot? Yes, I would. <clears throat> Dot, I'm, I'm so impressed, uh, not just with your story, but with your integrity which comes across very strongly. And, um, and I, of course, I can identify uh, with that period back in 57 uh, because the, what you were fighting was, uh, of course, it was really deep in the South, but it was all over the place. Uh, I ended up, I was a director of admissions at a boarding school um, in New Hampshire, and I uh, integrated that school, and it was not easy to do that. Um, so uh, I can so appreciate I could see attitudes um, in the North. And so I can well imagine the depth of the attitudes that you were describing. Uh, well, you have the whole community um, up against you. Uh, and uh, so I just have so much respect for not just you, but your family uh, who helped you uh, in that whole situation and have to, and actually, um, you know, raised you to be that kind of person. So I'm very impressed. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Joe. Thank you so very much. I just, um... We've got to wrap up. I hate to, hate to say goodbye to you because this has really been special. And I just, on behalf of all of us, uh, you know, your character, your, your, when, when Malcolm showed that picture to all of us, um, what struck me was your dignity at just in that dress and holding your head up. You had such dignity and, um, Sometimes in my life, where I felt like my best wasn't good enough, but you were certainly not a failure. You know, we say at Hyde that, that oftentimes in our obstacles, that's where we find our opportunities and where we find our purpose. And, you know, um, I got to believe that you coming to our community is giving us a purpose too, because we have a lot of work to do too. And, and our students are great and they need to believe in themselves. So uh, we did have a student who, who did say you talked about that you were having a birthday coming up. And um, so we're not gonna sing happy birthday and, we, and we're certainly not gonna make you tell us your age, but at Hyde, we tell our age. That's like one of the things- we're I, doing. I have no problem. Oh. When I say, I say to people, I have no problem telling my age. I am fortunate to be here. I'm now 78. I will be 79 in March. I have had both of my vaccines because I tell people I want to live as long as I can. And that's the only way that I'll be able to do the kinds of work that I'm trying to do. So I tell people, people say, oh, I don't tell my age. I said, I have no problem telling my age. I am proud of my age that I have lived as long as I have. And hopefully I will live as my mother died at 91, and I said, my hope is that I will live as long as she did, so. Well, you're, spring, you're, you're not the oldest person on this call, Dot. You're a spring chicken compared to Joey Chicken. 
Um, but I, uh, let's all give a little round of applause. And, and Dot, we, we just send you love and respect. And you're an honorary Hyde member. And we're going to be sending you a little care package. But um, we hope that we will connect again and have another conversation with you. Well, that's what I was going to say. You know, please keep in touch. Let me know how things are going on. Any, any group I talk to, you know, I like to keep them a part of my family. So just make sure that. You know, we have connections now, so we can always keep in touch. Please. Okay. Thank you, okay. everybody. And thank you, all of you. Okay. Bye-bye.